so it is. Okay? So the first question I came out is why fluorescent microscopy? Uh, and what we can do with a fluorescent microscopy? Uh, first of all, you have to image that fluorescent microscopy will allow you to determine the localization of specific, in a, or in using multiple color, multiple different elements. You will determine in this way the shape of things, the shape of organs, the shape of cells, the shape of organelles, and you will also able to, uh, to visualize the dynamics of these elements. That's why you will also have a training session with the live microscope. You will also uh, be able to study the protein interaction. Several techniques based on fluorescent microscopy allow to visualize the, the, uh, the contacting of between the different molecules and between different elements. Even though using fluorescent microscope, you can even ex uh, make an examination of the ion concentration. Let's think about calcium imaging, just for mention one, but you can have several different dyes for several different ions, for several different elements into the cells, visualizing oxidative stress, calcium, and other ions present into the cells. Again, why we really would like to take advantage of the fluorescent? First of all, comparing to a regular microscope, we first of all you can image we can achieve a higher contrast. We are not looking to a modification of the bright light of the white light to its own absorbance, its own uh, phase contrast, uh, its own change of uh, uh, polarization. Here, what we see is the production of the light from your elements. We will see later on how that allows us to have uh, a high specificity. That allow us, uh, with some limitation, to be quantitative because we can somehow correlate the amount of fluorescence we are measuring, we are counting the photons we are counting with the molecule producing that photon. Consider that sometimes the molecule producing the photon is not really the same amount of the molecule you are, you are considering. Uh, fluorescent microscopes uh, bring the base to produce the first uh, and uh, allow us to now reach the so-called high-resolution microscopy and the super-resolution microscopy in several cases, in, that's in the vast majority of the cases, was based on fluorescent microscopy. Right now, the new technology will allow us also to move on other system and also allow us to use uh, live cell imaging. Well, just a brief introduction on history. Uh, what the, who gave uh, birth of the, of the so-called phenomenon of fluorescence is John Herschel. A phenomenon of fluorescence is a natural phenomenon. It was known for centuries. It's not something new, but it was first described in the quinine uh, sulfate by John Herschel in, uh, and published in 1945. So if you want to try a tome and if you have uh, the right light, you can see how your uh, uh, Schweppes can be uh, slightly fluorescence due to the quinine inside. I, I didn't bring it here because we need to really to have a dark room, but I can assure you it works. <laughs> and thanks to the quinine. <coughs> so how this happened? What is the fluorescent principle? Uh, this, uh, I think, is, was one of the oldest graph, but also the simplest graph to explain the concept. Here is that we have electron present in, a, in one of the a normal basic state uh, energy state that receiving a photon of light or a quantum of energy is able in some condition that's why not all molecules are fluorescence to jump on a different state to jump on a different energetic level upon this excitation so-called phenomena you have a vibrational state and the coming back to the basic state with the release of energy this release of energy in several cases in the vast majority of cases is simply heat, and you don't see. In a small uh, amount of case, the fluorescent case, is the production of new light. Is the release also of a photon of energy. We will see, you will see it described during the next few minutes several times. But again, this observation is called Stokes observation and really have an absorption of light, here is just an example, can happen with the UV, but all molecules can have different light of excitation. So bringing to a higher level, energetic level, and then the fluorescence emission once, you, once the electron drop back to the, to the, so the so-called ground state. This phenomenon was uh, perfectly described by Don't Be Scared by the Yablowski diagram. Okay, 
this game every time. <laughs> okay, just uh, I just place this graph uh, not because I really mean you to know uh, everything inside, but to give you a couple of concepts. Uh, first of all, uh, you will meet several different types of fluorescent microscopy. Uh, the classical fluorescent microscopes that you will use as a confocal, as a live imaging, but also other microscopes right now on the market, like super resolution uh, microscope based on STED technology or based on uh, stochastic uh, production of uh, fluorescence technology. They all take advantage of different phenomena occurring into the, uh, to the electron present uh, in the molecule. So we have our electron here is just, again, the same graph as here, just reported in vertical. We have electron on the basal of the, of the ground state receiving quantum en of energy. They can get excited to different, even to different level, and they can go back producing fluorescence. You can even have a delayed fluorescence uh, with uh, the release of uh, light in much longer time. This phenomena is what you call phosphorescence, in fact, and get a completely different physical uh, phenomena in terms especially of timing. You have to image that fluorescence and phosphorescence are both type of luminescence, so light produced by your molecule, but uh, in the fluorescence, the emission of light is extremely rapid. Uh, I was citing you possible different techniques based on fluorescence. You will also meet uh, in your career the so-called FLIM, fluorescence lifetime microscopy, is one of the possible measures you can have on the fluorescence is how long the fluorescence lasts. You have to imagine you, have, you need instruments able to measure femtosecond uh, scale because uh, the fluorescence is really, really a rapid phenomenon, up to nanosecond, but it's really a rapid phenomenon. While phosphorescence, the emission continues from milliseconds to minutes, and that's what's happened on, uh, in your glasses in your, when, you, when you switch, on the light, switch off the light and elements, phosphorescence, uh, at home are able to bright for minutes, if not even hours. So the luminescence, uh, again, is uh, caused by the absorption of, a, of a radiant energies, such as ultraviolet, X-ray, or specific wavelength. You, have, uh, you can have uh, uh, this form of energy with the radiation that is known at the end as fluorescence. If the luminescence continue long after, that's, you can already divide that to the, to the other phenomena that is the phosphorescence. Again, so what we are looking right now is to define what's happened to the fluorophore that received the light and emit fluorescence. So we were speaking about the fact that uh, fluorophore, or element able to produce fluorescence, uh, receive a certain amount of light or a specific light and are able to produce their own light. So how this is generally described? This is generally described by the so-called fluorescent spectrum. Even though you will meet uh, fluorophore with uh, a specific label, a specific wavelength labeled on it, uh, that doesn't mean that these molecules are able to produce fluorescence just to that light. Every molecule has its own absorption <coughs> spectra here defined, here you see different wavelength and amount of, uh, let's say, percentage of absorption of this energy. So a fluorescent molecule is able in a wide part of the spectra to incorporate energy, to absorb energy with different efficiency. So that's, and that's what makes us, uh, the number you will find on the fluorophore, let's say Alexa 48, Dilight 48, that means that its maximum ability to uh, incorporate light and to convert this light in new light is at this uh, level of, uh, of this uh, wavelength. You see, you have also the emission spectrum. When you receive a quantum of light, you release a quantum of light to a different energy level. So for the conservation of energy low, you cannot produced the same amount of energy you receive, or even higher energy you receive. You probably already know, longer the wavelength, lower is the energy. So UV light is more energetic, we can say, than uh, green light, than red light, than infrared light, in these terms. So when we receive light, let's say, in the blue, in the, sorry, in the green color, we produce <coughs> red color. 
for instance, or far red color. We do not produce blue color. And this is the emission spectra. These two spectra, emission, absorption and emission, can be even be slightly overlapping. And this distance between the two peaks is called the Stokes shift. This is one element that you should probably know of your fluorescent element. You will use your fluorophore, your element, because this will define also which kind of microscope you will use, which kind of, uh, we will speak in a few minutes of filter cube of characteristic the microscope needs to have to see your fluorescence. Again, another example of fluorescence emission, you have an absorption, the so-called stoke shift, and the emission. The stoke shift is, in fact, the amount of energy that the fluorophore loses due to the vibrational state. So once you produce the, once you excite to this level of wavelength, you produce this level of light. There is also one so-called uh, mirror uh, image rule, because generally the two spectra, the absorption and the emission, are, at least for are pretty similar. They were considered like a mirror, uh, like a mirror here in the middle. In fact, it's not really true, because there are several other elements coming out uh, during, the, uh, during the phenomena that reduce and generally spread out the, uh, the emission spectra idea. So, what produces fluorescent is uh, what is called a component that is labeled with a fluorescent molecule or defluorescent molecule is called fluorophore. And upon the illumination with a specific uh, wavelength or group of wavelengths, we can uh, that are absorbed by the fluorophore, they, this fluorophore emit a longer wavelength of light, or let's say also a different color of light. You will experience the fact that the light seeing the light hitting into the microscope, hitting your sample is blue, and looking with your eyes into the ocular or through the computer, you will see a green. You will illuminate with the green and you will see with the red. So you have this change of light because with one light you excite, the light you uh, receive is the one produced by your element. As I mentioned you before, the fluorescence is a natural phenomenon. It's present in nature. We have several examples. But right now, for our uh, own purpose, for research purpose, we, uh, we let's say, we, we use much more uh, optimized fluorophore. That can be either protein, like this, as an example of uh, one cell science uh, cover with the, uh, with the different fluorescent protein that were optimized. Here you see their ex, uh, ex absorption or excitation spectra and emission spectra for EGFP, uh, green fluorescent protein, yellow fluorescent protein, blue fluorescent protein, and so on. So we have fluorescent protein itself. We also have elements able to label specific uh, part of the or specific protein into the cells, like probe for actin, like uh, a probe for DNA, the one you use in real-time PCR, for instance, they are fluorescent. Uh, antibody fluorescence, you have, as I told you before, a fluorescent indicator of the, of the uh, electric state, of the uh, calcium state, or different, or different biosensor that, can, that are keep on being developed. So you really uh, can use several different elements. Please consider that some of these fluorescent elements need a specific microscope to be used. If you use uh, calcium imaging uh, elements, you need quite a fast microscope able to collect several frames in a few seconds because the phenomena is rapid. When you just want to uh, work on fixed cells, like will be explained uh, for probably by Thea in the next uh, lectures, you want to, you, you, you work in a fixed state, so you can even uh, you can even use a regular epifluorescent microscope or a regular confocal microscope with no really fast scan. So which fluorophore, which parameters you could be interested in? in the, you have to consider every time the, which is the absorption, the so-called absorption coefficient. Generally, the most important element you should know is the quantum efficiency of your fluorophore. Some fluorophore uh, simply are designed to be uh, in that wavelength because maybe you need that specific color to match your instruments, but in fact they have a, a low quantum efficiency. Quantum efficiency is 
the level of light you produce or the, level, the quantum of light you produce for each quantum of light you receive. So uh, given the fact that the phenomena is not 100% uh, efficient, uh, you have to consider that some fluorophore uh, have a really low quantum efficiency. So you need to give them several quantum of energy to just receive one uh, quantum of energy back. You also have to consider the photostability of your fluorophore. Fluorophore get, start vibrating, start getting heat. They can move on a ground state, on a, sorry, on a uh, silent state. So they became uh, invisible to your eyes or to your cameras. Or they can be destroyed. Consider that, for instance, pitch or fluorescein, one of the first uh, uh, fluorophore used in uh, fluorescent microscopy, has uh, 10,000 excitation uh, round before being bleached. That seems a lot, but if you consider that each fluorescent phenomena is just take few nanoseconds in the end, that means that in few seconds you destroy your fluorescent. That's why we use a new, also new fluorophore uh, engineered to be more resistant to photo bleaching. And uh, you have to consider what is so-called the stock shift and how how large are their excitation and emission spectra because these affect the specificity of what you are seeing. Again, the characteristic of fluorescent. Consider that, as I told you before, given the fact the excitation spectrum is broad, if you excite at the maximum, at the optimum wavelength, you will receive the optimum amount of light. But even if you excite to a different uh, wavelength, you will receive the same light in, uh, as an answer, okay? Simply in a less efficient way, with a, le with a reduced quantum efficiency. So it's not that if you are uh, using this wavelength, you will receive here the light. In any case, the fluorophore will produce as a peak E zone color, but uh, with a different efficiency because if the uh, energy light is not optimized for the shape of the molecule, able to receive this light, you will reduce the, the amount of light that is produced. As I told you, basic feature of fluorescence, the excitation can occur really in 10 minus 15 uh, seconds. The emission is slightly longer, but again, it's really a short phenomena. And you can have a stoke shift. The so-called stoke shift is the separation between excitation and emission peaks. And the flutter bleaching rate really depends on the amount of energy that is dispersed in heat into your elements. And as I told you right at the beginning, please remember that while transmittance, like bright field microscope, is a subtractive phenomena in fluorescence, you, you see what happened to the light. In fluorescence, you have the light that is produced by your elements. So it's an additive uh, system. Again, just to remind you, as a conventional microscope, you use the light to illuminate the sample and you produce simply, simply, not all the time, simply, but a magnified image of the sample. While with a fluorescent microscope, you can use, you need to use a much higher intensity of light in the single point because you need to really give the correct, the enough energy to produce the fluorescence. The light, uh, and emitted by your elements will be to a longer wavelength, to, so to a shorter energy, the one of the, the one you used to excite. <coughs> and also in that case, you will have a magnified image in that case. So how this happened? Let's go to the, to the microscope. You are here for that reason. So uh, to, to have a fluorescent microscope, you need the, the correct light source. And you need the so-called filter cube that we will meet in a few minutes. There are also other systems, but the filter cube, let's say, is the common standard for this. So you need the fluorophore in your, in your sample, or at least molecule able to produce fluorescence. But then you need the right lamp. Here I just mentioned you some examples. There are xenon heart lamp, mercury lamp, metalite, LED, uh, LED, laser, and the filter cube. How they are placed? So in a regular uh, bright field microscope, the light needs to, this is an upright microscope, so you have the sample here, you have your objective here, and your eyes here, or your cameras here, okay? In a bright field setup, your light will pass through the sample. In the 
fluorescent microscope in generally, you have the light reaching the sample throughout your same objective, so being focused on the elements using the same objective. Then, theoretically, let's say a vast majority of the light is, is gone, is dispersed. You are using a, a green light, for instance, hitting the sample, and this green light, once hit the sample or not hitting the sample, is spread away. Then you have the light produced by your sample, collected by the objective, and reaching your eyes. So the lamp that I'm sorry you saw here can be here or can be even uh, right now half a meter away or two meter away throughout the uh, uh, optical fibers is can be a different lamp in uh, just for historical reason we are still using in some uh, microscope mercury arc lamp we also use a uh, uh, metralite lamp you see each of these lamp if you see that well don't look at them uh, without protection but if you see the lamp on you see simply a white light, not, not, not even extremely bright in terms of uh, intensity. In fact, it's extremely, look, the mercury arc lamp is extremely UV lamp. So don't look uh, to a microscope uh, uh, UV light uh, lamp uh, with your own eyes because you get burned. Your microscopy career will be short really soon. So don't look at the lamp. And also consider that if you are uh, moving filters or dismantling a microscope. I saw people opening a microscope with the fluorescent lamp on, okay? Take care of what you're doing because this is the, practically the only uh, dangerous things you can do on a microscope uh, unless uh, giving your uh, finger into, the, into the, the plug of the electricity, okay? This is really the only dangerous thing that you can do on a microscope. So now we also have LED. This LED allows us to have really specific wavelength. Sorry, okay, really specific wavelength to excite in a really specific manner the different flora. So how we excite the flora for in a specific manner? You have, you have to imagine GFP, green fluorescent protein. You need a blue light to excite the green fluorescent protein and the fluorescent protein will be green. How we manage this mixed up of light? We use the so-called filter cube. This is generally present in all fluorescent microscope. So after the lamp, the light produced by the lamp is generally a plethora of different wavelengths. Even starting with an LED, you use a filter cube. So you first need an excitation filter. An excitation filter is a barrier allowing just the wavelength you are deciding to use to pass through, while the other elements of the lamp, the other elements of light, will be removed from this, from this, uh, from this components. So uh, the light is passing and meet the so-called, it's generally called dichroic mirror. I think it's also a little bit a mistake. It's in fact a dichromatic mirror. But for, I don't really know why, for historical reason, we, we keep on calling it dichroic mirror. What does it mean, dichroic mirror? It means that it's able to do two things for two different, different group of wavelengths. One thing, it's a mirror. So to the light reaching, in that case the blue, this is a mirror, and project the light to your sample. So in this way, from the lamp, you are able to select one specific wavelength and to project this specific wavelength to your sample. Then your sample will, if it's fluorescent, will start producing fluorescence. And will produce fluorescence uh, in all directions. The objective will collect just the light coming in that direction. The light, in that case, will reach again the so-called dichroic mirror. In that case, we don't want that light to be mirrored and going away. We want that light to pass through. So this is a window, an open window, for the green light. So that's why it's dichroic. Because for the blue light, in that case, is a mirror. For the green light, it's an open window. Okay, Not 100% efficient. There are physical limits to this uh, transparency or to this uh, uh, mirror. But let's say, in a, right now, the, the level of uh, the producer is so high that uh, is almost practically transparent to the specific wavelength of your fluorophore. Again, you have a second filter uh, called emission filter. This will allow to cut away all the other lights able to escape this gate, this barrier made by the dichroic mirror, 
and in this way you will collect with your eyes or with your camera or with your photo multiplier in the case of a, of a confocal microscope, you will be able to receive just the, the light you are looking at. Generally, these filters are designed, and we will see later, to fit the uh, excitation and emission spectra that we saw before. Uh, when you see the characteristic of a filter, of a filter cube, are generally described by the superimposition of this three line. So you have a line with the ability to be transparent to the, the excitation just to the blue light. So you see the blue light is able to pass the excitation filter, while the green and the red and the other light are blocked. Then the dichroic mirror, this line means that is completely blocking, means that is a mirror, the blue light, while for the green light and the red light is uh, transparent, so the green light coming back is transparent, and then you have the emission filter later on, which is transparent just to the green light. If, you, if for instance, you are producing also, by mistakes one, or by chance, there's some red light in these elements, this red light is, will be able to pass the dichroic mirror, but will be blocked by the emission filter, so you will just collect the green light, in that case of GFP or any uh, Fitch, uh, fluorescein, uh, anything in that uh, kind of spectrum. Again, another example in that case, just the light is coming from the left, the concepts are the same, so blue light, sample, mirror uh, being transparent for the green light and goes <coughs> to the eyepiece. This is how it looks in real life, so with the excitation filter, the 45 degrees uh, mirror and the emission detector if you have your eyes up there. Please consider if you are working on an inverted microscope, everything will be reverted, but the main concept is again, is, is light coming, reaching the sample, and then going to the, sorry, reaching uh, mirror, going to the sample, and from the sample produced going to the eyes. As I told you, how this uh, works in terms of uh, uh, filter. When you have uh, one filter cube in your microscope, you also uh, know, and you know from its name, from the company the name gave, every company produce and give you also this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of graph showing you at which wavelength is uh, transparent. You see the excitation filter, in that case here, sorry, here, excitation is transparent for to that light, then you have this, green, this yellow light is the mirror, so that means that this light will be blocked by this mirror and will, be, will go to the sample, and from the sample we go back, we'll be able to bypass the filter because the emission filter is right here. So what's the problem with this system? Just one, you need one filter cube, or let's say one combination of filters for each fluorophore you're using or for each family of fluorophore. Two different green fluorophore can share the same, uh, the same cube or the same uh, mix, the, the same uh, setup, but in fact you will not use these two fluorescents in the same experiment because they will be undistinguishable. They will be equally green for you, so you will not be able to see them in this kind of system. Now, with uh, uh, confocal system, we also have so-called spectral system, where we are able to avoid this mechanical blockade and this mechanical feature, at least uh, partially, and in that case, you are much more flexible. There are some companies producing this kind of system, and so in, for, in several types of microscopy, you can avoid this, but I have to admit, in the, given the fact, at least to my experience, 80% of the time is spent on regular epifluorescent microscope, regular live imaging microscope, uh, or uh, even classical, basic, uh, confocal microscope, you will deal with filter cubes or with the system of this. And again, you see popular fluorophore or more common fluorophore and the different condition of filter cube. That means that each filter cube allows you to have a, a color and also to be specific for the elements you are seeing. As I told you at the beginning, fluorescence allow you to see different elements in a specific manner and these different elements can be visualized together, together in two different moments, but in the same, in the same uh, cells. Why I'm speaking about two different moments? Because generally, either you are using the light on one filter cube, either you are using on a second filter cube. 
There are specific cases with uh, particular filter cube uh, splitted uh, and with light hitting two of them, like in particular calcium imaging setup. Generally, you are using one filter cube collecting your green channel and then your red channel and then your blue channel and so on. And then you superimpose or your, the software you're using will superimpose the image with the different channel you're using. Some take a message for you because it's important to remember thinking about the different uh, floor for you will, be, you, you will use is the fact that the longer the wavelength you will uh, use and the lower is the energy that you will apply that somehow has uh, some implication also to the stability of the uh, floor for you're using and, uh, and the fact that the shorter the wavelength higher the energy so we would maybe would like to use because are really bright uh, uh, sometimes UV <coughs> light to to excite fluorophore and then we have uh, you please consider that using UV light uh, can be somehow uh, dangerous in uh, even in the confocal uh, microscopes setups I remember till a few years ago if you add a uh, few seven, eight years ago, but if you add a UV source light, you need to cage everything under your microscope to avoid the possibility that this, the, the beam of light can came out from some uh, unwanted scattered elements into the microscope and that can hit your, can hit your uh, eyes. Uh, now, I have to admit, all the systems are much better uh, metal sealed and you don't need it anymore. But till a few years ago, you really need to have everything sealed up if you use a uh, a laser in the UV, in the UV uh, spectrum. Intensity. So what makes a fluorescent uh, phenomena uh, with molecule fluorescence and what change? The way uh, the intensity is related to the probability of the event. Uh, what I want you to give with this um, sentence. Fluorescence is a stochastic phenomenon. Uh, that means that uh, all of you are fluorescent microscope, are fluorescent uh, are fluorophore. I will eat all of you in the same time with light. Only a part of you will be replying, will be producing light in that particular moment. So, given that phenomena, you have to consider that somehow it's not the case to increase the amount of light to increase the intensity. Okay? You have a limit. After, after a while, will be subtle. If it's stochastic, that means that it generally just 30% of you, fluorescent molecule, will reply. That means that even if I double the energy, I will not get 60% of you producing the light. Stochastically, you will be more or less, we will be with the same, we will increase the intensity just in terms of the probability, not the one molecule fluorescent give that amount of light. It's not that if I hit that molecule stronger, that molecule will produce higher light. If you have more molecule, you will produce more light. But it's not that the same molecule heated with a higher level of energy will produce higher light. That's important, especially when you work with confocal microscope, because uh, when I started, when the classical mistake or the tendency was, oh, I have 100% of laser at my, uh, under my hands. So let's use this laser as a Star Wars uh, uh, <laughs> sword. Okay, it's not the case because you will just burn your element, your fluorophore. You will not excite, you will not produce more intense image. If your image is not intense, it's due to your fluorophore that are not enough, maybe. Okay? Or maybe because your microscope is not able to collect uh, the light you want to, but it's not increasing the power of the light that you will increase the intensity of the fluorescence. Okay? Maybe the number, you will increase the number of molecules excited, stochastically, but not the single molecule intensity. Again, wavelength is a measure of the energy absorbed, and as I told you, that can change a little bit the yeah. Now, I, just before uh, finishing my part, I just want to give you some example because it's uh, clear that you will play in your uh, here and your career with fluorescent microscopy. So, uh, just remember that you can have uh, direct coupling to macromolecules macromolec in fluorescence. You can have fluorescence dye and different substrate that are fluorescent. You can have fluorescent fusion protein, and you can have fluorescent antibodies. Let's say, in my case, I generally use uh, pretty often fluorescent antibodies 
or somehow uh, fluorescent dye able to uh, bind to cytoskeletal element. Please remember one thing every time. In this occasion, uh, not in the fluorescent fusion protein, but in the other case, you are looking to the fluorescence of two, you are looking to the fluorophore. You are not looking to the elements labeled by the fluorophore. So as uh, probably Thea will point out, if you are making wrong binding of the fluorophore or the antibody to your elements, you are not looking to your elements. You are looking to the, even though not even the primary antibodies, the secondary antibody of what, so please consider the, with fluorescence, you are, uh, you are not looking to, uh, to your elements, you are looking to the flag you supposedly placed on your elements. That's the biggest limitation right now in fluorescent microscopy that you need to remember because somehow people say, oh, I'm looking to this. No, we are, let's go a little bit in, uh, it's a little bit philosophical if we want, but it's like uh, um, Platone looking into the, uh, looking to just a shadow of what is illuminated by light. So what are you looking here is just a secondary element labeling your element of interest, okay? Somehow it's pretty direct, let's say DAPI, UXT, DNA labeling marker, these are intercalating dye for your DNA, okay? It's pretty simple, imagine that these molecules are connected to or really bound to the DNA and it's easy to understand that, okay, the DNA is there, I'm looking at, while with secondary antibody, primary antibody, you are looking to something that is either distant or either not every time so specific as you would expect. In any case, what you can achieve with fluorescent microscopy is to have multicolor. You have, as I told you before, three filter cubes, one for the blue, one for the green, one for the red, software or manually superimposed, and you can produce your image, as you can see, with high contrast. As I told you right at the beginning, why high contrast? Because are the elements producing the light. So the background is black and the light is, is uh, coming out. That's why, for instance, you will never have on this screen the same contrast you have on, this, on your smartphone, on your TV screen, because your TV screen is producing the light. This screen is not producing the light, it's just reflecting the light from the, from the uh, projector, okay? So that's the difference in contrast. <laughs> your fluorescent molecule will be, will, will be used to increase the contrast. Again, some other few examples, you will use elements able to, these are a fluorescent uh, molecule able to bind the cytoskeletal, able to bind the nuclei, to visual, able, allowing you to visualize the cells in life, to see the cells uh, moving, growing, and to, and to really identify single elements in the cell. Just the final concept, and uh, I think we will be done. Fluorescent principle, when a certain compound is illuminated with a high energy light, they emit a different, lower frequency, longer wavelength, lower frequency. Uh, this phenomena is the fluorescence. It often, the specimen that shown, they, uh, you will meet often the so-called autofluorescence. Every uh, several elements you use to process your cells, like PFA or formamine, or elements that you use can interact with your sample, can produce their own fluorescence. It's not a, uh, it's not a, let's say, not specific. It's the fact that you have a molecule able to produce fluorescence in the color you are using it. So uh, you definitely need bright fluorophore to overcome this uh, autofluorescent presence and to avoid uh, to mix up the signal and to, and to make these kind of mistakes in the presence. And just as a, as a small summary, because I know I gave you a lot of uh, information, so I just want to give you just the three slides to, uh, to show you. You, can, you. you will use or you can use fluorescence either to even all animal, single cells, single elements of the cells, these white dots are a synaptic button. The absorbance spectro, spectrum limits the excitation because you have to consider that one molecule that absorbs in one spectrum cannot emit in the same spectrum. At least you, cannot, you will not be able to collect the light in that similar, in that same spectrum. 
and the fact that the molecule returning to the low, lowest vibrational state will also emit heat, so you will need to take care of this element. And with this, I think that uh, the other elements were already given, so I will thank you for your attention. Please, if you have any question, I'm more than happy to take your curiosity or question about fluorescence. Thank you.